This pink-colored Roseville Pottery Dealer sign was a gift to the guest. Roseville was an American art pottery manufacturer who made this piece for display purposes in the 19th and 20th centuries. Most of the Roseville pottery made in the 1940s is not very valuable, but this particular piece is an exception due to its color pink, which is considerably rarer and more desirable. This type of Roseville pottery sign is often found damaged and tossed around for various reasons. However, we're in a different world. Change, and that works to your advantage. Very often things that were cherished when, when they were made get preserved and become worth less as a result of that. This is just the opposite. Judging by how people cherish it nowadays and its pink color, the piece is estimated to be worth $2,250 to $2,750. Really? That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I'd... Yeah, you know, what do you say? <laughs> that makes you speechless. These silver figurines evoke the masterpieces of 19th century European artistry and came into the possession of this guest family through his great-grandfather, who acquired them during his journeys to London. The figurine set consists of four items made in different parts of Europe, with the gesture figurine adorned with semi-precious jewels, featuring curved shoes and a hat, giving it a whimsical vibe. Similarly, the cat figurine conforms to this humorous aesthetic, with large earrings and a green jewel fixed to its eyes. The two gestures and cat figurines are made with 1800-grade silver, typical of items made in Germany, while the bull figurine has a 925 silver grade, common in items made in England. Additionally, the bull figurine features a series of British hallmarks, substantiating the claim that it is a sterling-grade figurine made in England. Interestingly, each figurine is estimated to be worth about three to four thousand dollars, while as a collection, it should go for twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars at auction. <laughs> I, you know, what do you say? <laughs> that makes you speechless. Jeez, market has really. <laughs> well, I promised that I wasn't going to say, "Oh my God!" But, oh my God! <laughs> Imagine owning a painting that holds within its colors. The painting is by a famous artist named William Robinson Lee. It is called Navajo Camp No. 1. It shows life in the western part of America, with a scene of people around a campfire. He liked to paint primarily Indian tribes, uh, Zunis, Hopis, and Navajos. The artist paid a lot of attention to making the light and textures look just right. Although the painting is a bit old and has some small problems like paint flaking off, it's still in pretty good shape. It also has its original frame, which is also quite old, possibly from the 1920s. Someone who knows a lot about art said that paintings like this have become more valuable over time, and they think this one could be worth $75,000 now. Jeez. The market has really... <laughs> well, I promised that I wasn't going to say, oh, my God, but, oh, my God. <laughs> Great. I'm surprised. An heirloom passed down through generations, a unique vessel shrouded in mystery. Inherited from their Scottish grandmother, it crossed the Atlantic to find a new home. The appraiser marvels at the piece's most striking feature, a medallion. On the bottom, there is a crossed swords mark, the hallmark of Meissen, who was one of the most celebrated German porcelain manufacturers. This prestigious mark, often imitated, confirms the authenticity of the piece. Meissen, a German powerhouse, stands in stark contrast to the initial assumptions of French origins. The sword mark narrows down the creation date to somewhere between 1850 and 1924. This particular mark tells us that the piece was done between 1850 and 1924. While the specific artist remains a mystery, the quality and style point toward the 1880s. The appraiser estimates the piece to fetch between three and $5,000 at auction. Great. Great. I'm surprised. Apparently, this guest came to the show with two ukuleles made by Leonardo Nunez and Kamika. He saw the first one at a trade show and was fascinated by its look, which he'd later bought for $200. The second one was purchased courtesy of the guest Ingenuity. And this is sitting on the shelf, and they were charging $125 for it, but it had a crack, a couple small cracks in it, and I offered them 100 and they took it, so... 
There are classic ukuleles made by Leonardo Nunez, whose father is attributed to being the father of the ukulele. However, ukuleles aren't as quite valuable, but it's a classic handmade Hawaiian ukulele made of koa wood. The other ukulele is called the pineapple because of its shape. You can see the pineapple on the front, but the shape is, is like the pineapple. Uh, this was made by Kamaka. This would have been made in uh, the late 1920s. Due to their condition, the Kamaka ukes is estimated to fetch $1,200, while the Nunez uke is worth $1,000. I did well then. You did very well. Okay, great. <laughs> a unique machine was brought by the guest. It was designed to core and peel apples. The machine was purchased about 20 years ago for 15 pounds. Guest bought it out of admiration for its mechanical nature, but admitted to never using it. The appraiser guided the guest about its operation and expressed amazement at its functionality. The machine's worth was gauged to be between... 250 and 350 pounds. Really? Yeah. Oh, word. <laughs> I made <laughs> Thank you very much. Guest brought in a stunning piece of Japanese Satsuma ware, a high-fired earthenware known for its distinctive crackled glaze. Satsuma ware emerged in response to Japan opening its door to the West in the mid-1800s. A particularly renowned maker, Soking Kazan, had two tiered production pieces. Regular customers received factory made pieces, while those seeking exceptional quality were invited to his private studio for the finest works. This piece is one of those top tier creations, likely a tea canister, but potentially never used for its intended purpose. Here, there is Soking Kazan's mark and a series of inscriptions, including Great Japan and the artist's signature. Oyan. There are the meticulously hand-painted decorations, featuring landscapes, figures, and a fantastical dog-like creature. Then there's the use of gold, a signature technique by Soking Kazan, and the remarkable detail achieved with the single brush hair. The piece's exceptional quality and pristine condition fetch it an auction price of... Eight to ten thousand pounds. Blimey! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> guest casually brought in a brooch, unaware of its true worth. She had been wearing it for years as a simple accessory, even taking it to a jeweler for minor repairs. The jeweler, however, made a startling revelation. The brooch was not costume jewelry, but a valuable antique. Its design and safety clasp pointed towards Russian origins, likely intended as part of a larger stomacher ornament. The intricate details and use of both platinum and gold for contrasting effects suggested exceptional craftsmanship. The maker's mark was done by Theodore Lauer, a renowned jeweler known for his opulent creations. Further inspection revealed Russian hallmarks, solidifying the brooch's authenticity and historical significance. While a previous jeweler had offered a mere 5,000 pounds to scrap the piece, having recognized its artistic merit, its current value is... Ten thousand pounds. Oh. French ones. Yeah. The guest, a retired history teacher, brought in a remarkable piece of history: a letter penned by P. T. Barnum himself in 1872. He had received this treasure back in 1957 from his sister's client. Barnum details his desire to acquire braves, squaws, and papooses for his exhibit a request that exposes his insensitive view of indigenous people as mere curiosities for entertainment. The guest, with his background in history, finds this detail particularly significant, highlighting a bygone era's perspective on cultural difference. Well, I learned a couple of things, one of which is the importance of sideshows and carnivals at that point in time. That was America's recreation. The letterhead features the American Museum logo, crediting Barnum's use of such stationery as a testament to his progressive marketing strategies. He had an envelope that was printed with the same logos and names as this one, and the signature on it is big and bold, which is very important. Even without any accompanying artifacts from Barnum's museum, the letter itself could hold a value of $500 to $1,000. Looking beyond historical intrigue, the letter has a value of... $5,000. Okay. Yeah, now that exceeds my expectations. The guest brought in two beautiful clocks made by Elmer Stans, a skilled work worker with a dark past. Clocks are reproductions of classic designs, a garandal and lyre clock. 
Despite being made in the 1970s, they were modeled after earlier styles popular in the 1820s. Stins, while a drafted craftsman, had a history of violence. Dubious distinction of murdering his first wife. This morbid detail adds a layer of intrigue to Sten's work, making his clocks surprisingly collectible. Stins even made clocks while imprisoned, marking them with MCIP, meaning either Made Case in Prison or Massachusetts Correctional Institute, Plymouth. These prison-made clocks are particularly sought after by collectors. Both clocks are signed on the dial and have his trademark insignia, which is a little fly. Despite the disturbing details about the maker, the Lyre clock was estimated at $4,500, and the Grandel clock is at $6,500, bringing the total value of the pair to a surprising... Oh, that's wonderful. Well, that, that's great. Well, we enjoy them so much. We just think they're very beautiful, but what a violent past they a clock maker had. This was brought by a guest with a little note to the show. I have a little note that was written in 1922, I believe. It was made in Germany about 1840. This is used to display and showcase their hats. Milliner's model dolls are typically made of plastic or papier-mâché. The head is papier-mâché. Papier-mâché is a very fragile substance. It can break easily. The paint can crack and flake off easily. It has a fancy hair and a leather body with wooden arms and legs, and they can be customized to resemble a variety of face shapes and skin tones. These dolls are an important tool for milliners and are essential for promoting products. The appraiser values the item. $1,800 to $2,000. She's a survivor. <laughs> this mysterious pool table game board just came out of the attic, and it belonged to the owner's great-grandfather who ran a hall in Ringstead, Iowa. Let's see what secrets it holds. This Schaefer Combination Recreation Board offered unique variations of classic games like poker, kino, and baseball during the 1930s and 40s. You see, it's a Schaefer Combination Recreation Board Made in Peoria, Illinois. That's really kind of interesting. It's a distinctive piece, once resting on a pool table slope where pool balls found their place. The design and the fact that it was made in Peoria, Illinois, offer compelling evidence of its 1920s origins. It boasts vibrant colors and is in excellent condition, accentuated by the captivating baseball game graphic. The guest paid $22 for it, as indicated by the pencil marking on the back. The value of the piece has skyrocketed due to its rarity, with only three known to have been sold at auction. Twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. Oh, very and, good. And, you know, I'm just really excited to see it. It brings back my youth. The guest showcased a vase acquired from his grandparents' house in Connecticut. It had been kept in a curio cabinet for many, many years. The appraiser identified it as a cruet made by Moser. Founded by Ludwig Moser in 1857, it was renowned as one of the best glass works in the world. The piece likely dated back to the late 19th century, known for its high quality and appeal to high-end customers. The vase featured wonderful gilding and enamel decoration. The top of the stopper exhibited gorgeous insect motifs. The appraiser highlighted these matching numbers on the stopper and base, indicating their original pairing. The vase was appraised at an intriguing value of... $3,000. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So retail, retail value, retail value of $3,000, yeah. Okay. And it's a really, really nice example of its type. Oh. Real treat you. to have you bring it in. <laughs> thank you. Inherited from her mother-in-law, knowing that this piece was produced in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, this jug holds a special place in the world of porcelain collectibles. It was crafted by the Ott and Brewer, the mark word was Belique, which reflects the meticulous attention to detail and skilled artistry of its creators. The hand-painted designs featuring vibrant colors and intricate patterns never fail to captivate me. Despite their age, this item remains in demand among collectors. These rare finds are not just items for display, they are cherished heirlooms. Odd and Brewer's American Belique Lotus piece is a cherished gem, a reminder of the beauty and craftsmanship of a bygone era. At auction level, it's between $1,500 and $2,500. And it's a really, really nice example of its type. Oh, real well, treat you. to have you bring it in. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> you 
you win some, you lose some, I guess. <laughs> This is a stunning turquoise necklace with vibrant stones gleaming under lights. The guest received it as a gift celebrating a hard-won work-life balance 25 years ago. Went to another job, and this was my gift to myself at that time. The guest believes it to be Italian-made from 1905, featuring Turkish turquoise and diamonds. The turquoise is indeed magnificent, and the design is elegant yet wearable. However, upon closer inspection... The brilliant cut diamonds, a modern design element, cast doubt on the claimed 1905 origin. Diamonds in overall design suggest a creation date closer to 1960 to 1965. Despite this, this piece is undeniably Italian craftsmanship, boasting 18 karat gold and top quality Persian turquoise. Diamonds sparkle throughout, adding a touch of luxury. Given these details, the appraiser estimates a current auction value of eight to twelve thousand dollars, which is somewhat less than you paid for it. While a true nineteenth-century equivalent could reach the original price at retail, possibly even fifteen thousand dollars. I like it. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. I guess. <laughs> this porringer is believed to have passed through six generations. The guest guessed its origin as England, but the appraiser shared its real origin. It's basically originated from Boston, Massachusetts. It was first made for children. Crafted by Benjamin Burke, it bears his maker's mark, who specialized in silverware for children. The family previously believed it to be of English origin. The value of this porringer ranges from six to $8,000. You are kidding. No, I'm not. Oh, my word. small garment, intricately adorned beautifully. This isn't just a child's jacket. It's a window into the artistic traditions and cultural heritage of the Crow people. The jacket, crafted sometime in the 1880s, hails from the Crow tribe of Montana. Their beadwork and quillwork are renowned for the intricate details and symbolic language. This particular piece, likely made for a young boy, serves as a rare glimpse into the artistic expression of Crow children's clothing. The guest inherited this piece from their great-grandparents, collectors of Native American artifacts in the 1890s. The jacket itself is a masterpiece in miniature. At auction, this amazing piece is estimated to fetch a remarkable four to $6,000. Inherited from her grandfather's family, it's a charming piece indeed. It's a classic wooden chair with a distinctive feature, made in Pennsylvania. It's perfect for jotting down notes or enjoying a cup of tea while penning a letter. Crafted with comfort and functionality in mind, the writing arm, typically positioned on the right side, provides a convenient spot for writing utensils or small items. These chairs often feature a timeless design, with spindle backrest and gracefully curved armrest. Original decoration with old surface. This is a, a stencil decorated. Um, and the background is, uh, is grain painted to look like an exotic wood, rosewood, for example. They evoke a sense of nostalgia and warmth. It was made from rich, rustic oak. Its versatility makes them suitable for both traditional and contemporary interiors. Let's say for auction purposes, it's around $1,500. I could care of it. Thank you. This rug, initially used as a doormat, caught the eye of an antique enthusiast who visited the guest home. Despite the guest mother initially dismissing any intention to sell, she later recognized its potential value and moved it to the dining room for display. The appraiser notes the rug's uniqueness, particularly by its size, which is uncommon for rugs of its type. In her dining room, where it stayed in a little corner in the dining room, and it wasn't used in the entry hall anymore for wiping your feet on Estimated at about two feet by three and a half feet, its origins are believed to be northwest Persian, possibly made by Kurds, based on the weave. What sets this rug apart is its vibrant colors and intricate design. The use of overdyed green, a combination of indigo and yellow, adds depth and richness to the piece. The outlining of the little rosettes, the little meander borders are very graceful. The meticulous detailing and graceful patterns, including rosettes and meander borders, further enhance its beauty. Despite its humble beginnings, this rug is highly collectible and could fetch between $25 and $3,500. 
just for a little rub, white just feet on. Just a little <laughs> rub to wipe your feet on. <laughs> The guest purchased a wood-carved eagle at an auction, originally advertised simply as a wood-carved eagle, until the auctioneer later mentioned the possibility of it being crafted by John Haley Bellamy. John Haley Bellamy was a renowned folk art carver specializing in eagles. Born in 1836 and raised in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Bellamy later established a shop in Kittery, Maine, crafting eagle plaques similar to the guest. He excelled at carving figureheads and panels frequently adorned with eagles. Bellamy's eagles, carved from white pine, were sold as tourist items. Okay. Many of his eagles have, above the main body, a banner. Bearing the inscription as, Don't give up the ship. Due to his popularity, imitations of Bellamy's eagles, including the guest, were produced. Crafted by the Artistic Carving Company of Boston between 1935 and 1965, the company replicated Bellamy's style, but lack the elegance of his original work. Hence, there are significant distinctions between these replicas and the authentic originals. The guest paid $1,700 for the eagle, but its retail value today is... Around $200 retail value. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I had no clue. None. Military flags are pivotal symbols of identity, history, and unity serving integral roles in battlefield communication and leadership. This military flag, owned by the guest father, who served on the submarine place during World War II, bears markings indicating Japanese ships destroyed or damaged in combat. During World War II, the USS Place, a Bilal-class submarine launched in 1943, patrolled the South Pacific. The Disney-inspired insignia on the flag reflects Walt Disney's significant role in World War II military insignia. Here is a record of the ship's service during those patrols. These Japanese flags on the military flag represent merchant vessels sunk by the place during World War II. A red disc with a white center indicates a damaged vessel. Let's take a look at the meanings of the Japanese flags. These typically signify mine lane missions. This signifies the survival of crew members after a ship's sinking. The smaller pennants denote vessels of lower tonnage, including harbor patrol craft. And the indication of hash marks? This one doesn't significantly diminish the value of the piece. The appraiser has assessed the value to be between $2,500 to $3,000. Oh my goodness. I had no clue. None. The guest inherited this chair, which is part of a set of three from their grandmother. She believed it was made by William Savory, a renowned 18th century furniture maker. Although only one chair bore the William Savory label, the appraiser recognized the distinctive style of Savory's work. The chair featured a serpentine crest, a maple rush seat, a vase splot, cabriole legs with angular knees, and feet typical of Savory's designs. The appraiser expressed excitement about the chair's authenticity and style. Despite lacking a label, the chair's distinctive style and original tiger maple finish contributed to its value. Based on its quality and design, the appraiser estimated the value of the single chair to be between $30,000 to $40,000 is, is a single. Look at that shape. Look at those That's legs. That's a beautiful chair. I've always admired just great. The guest expressed admiration for the chair's beauty and form, acknowledging its significance and value in the world of antique furniture. The guest's parents purchased these paintings by Matthias Alton in the late 1960s. fortunate enough to go to the new Grand Rapids Art oh. Museum yesterday, and there's quite a representation of his work there. Alton, a German immigrant who settled in Grand Rapids as a teenager, had a distinctive impressionistic style characterized by heavy impasto and a preference for landscapes. This painting, however, exhibited a softer, more pastoral quality compared to Alton's typical style. The appraiser estimated the value of the first painting to be between $15,000 and $20,000. Another painting by Allen in the guest possession was valued at approximately $7,000 and $10,000 range. Oh, my gosh. The guest expressed delight and gratitude at the appraisal, as it had exceeded her expectations. This beautiful watercolor painting, titled Death of the House Cat, was made by Clifford Odets in 1947. A renowned American playwright of the 20th century, 
Clifford Odets is known for his significant contributions to the New York theater scene with plays like Waiting for Lefty and Awake and Sing. This painting was acquired by the guest father at auctions in the mid-1960s, and it has been cherished by her ever since. The painting reflected Odette's talents for mid-century modern artwork, a style highly sought after today. The playful yet surreal depiction of nine cats emerging from a structure added depth to the piece. Considering its significance as a work by Odette's and its appeal as a mid-century modern painting, the appraiser valued it at an impressive five to seven thousand dollars. The guest expressed surprise and gratitude at the appraisal, indicating that the painting would return to its place of honor on their wall. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I didn't think it was worth anything like that. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yes, indeed. So, you have a real, real treasure here. The guest introduced an item, a jar, that belonged to his grandmother and was used to store string over the kitchen sink. The appraiser praised the wonderful thing and noted the original label on it, which was made in New York City around 1880. The jar was originally displayed behind a bar to advertise beer, specifically Gambrinus Lager beer. It had a reverse on glass applied label involving painting on the reverse side of the curved glass and then applying it to the mug. The appraiser discovered another label with 50 on it, indicating a possible price tag from a garage sale. The item's potential value overwhelmed the guess. Two and four thousand dollars. Oh, go on. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, you have a real, real treasure here. The guest brought a piece of artwork to the show, acquired in an auction in Glasgow 25 years ago for 110 pounds. It was believed to be by Ellis Larry, known for his work on matchstick men. However, the appraiser discussed a lot of fake Larry artworks due to his popularity. The appraiser examined the drawing, noting its sophisticated portrayal of figures in town square. Larry's work skillfully captured the essence of both animals and human figures. The drawing resembled a preliminary sketch for Lowry's Street Scene, 1950, featuring a conductor in the middle of a crowd. The appraiser wondered if the drawing was a copy or an authentic preparatory work for Lowry's painting. If proven to be authentic, it could be worth up to $10,000. The guest family heirloom included a pair of historic bowls. They'd been in the family for generations and were found in their grandfather's house in Iran. The appraiser noted the bowl's eastern shape, indicating they were made in Europe for export to eastern markets like India and Southeast Asia. The bowls had two marks underneath. One was Medici, noting an English design from the 1840s, and the other was a maker's mark indicating the George Jones factory in Staffordshire. Additionally, the bowls had a Persian inscription, making them around 150 years old. Despite their historical significance, a crack in one bowl impacted their auction value. The value suggested by the appraiser was... Two, three hundred pounds, something like that. Amidst the poignant task of sifting through their late father's possessions, the guests stumbled upon the watch suspecting it belonged to either their grandmother or great-grandmother. The item's origins is Geneva, Switzerland, highlighting its historical significance, predating the era when Swiss watches were renowned for precision engineering. Instead, it showcased exquisite enamel work and diamonds adorning its back, reflecting Geneva's reputation for fine jewelry and craftsmanship since the 17th century. The appraiser admired the intricate detailing typical of mid-19th century decorative watches, such as ornate scrollwork and rose-cut diamonds reminiscent of Victorian jewelry styles. Inside the watch bore the maker's signature, wound by a key, and continued to function smoothly, underscoring its quality and durability. It's estimated to fetch between $3,500 and $4,500. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's great. I had no idea. In the 1970s, some young people found a special book at a market in Mexico City. The guest bought it for a mere $22. The book is called Mexico and has drawings of different places in Mexico. The text found within the book is presented in both English and Spanish. Primarily, the book showcases the works of an artist who specialized in illustrating scenic views. While the artist contributed some illustrations, 
they primarily focused on compiling and arranging the content. The complete book contains approximately 28 prints, although only one is currently displayed. The prints, all in sepia tone, depict various scenes across Mexico, including cathedrals and views of Mexico City. Additionally, some prints feature military events and soldiers. The book is old and a bit damaged. The pages are stained, some are loose, and a few pictures are missing. But it's still worth a lot of money, around four to $6,000. Each picture could sell for five to $1,000. If the book was in perfect condition, it could be worth ten to $15,000, or even $25,000 if it was colored. The guest Art Deco Platinum and Diamond Necklace, dating to around 1925, originally belonged to the guest great-great-great-aunt. When the great-great-great-aunt passed away in the early 1970s, the guest father wanted to buy the necklace from the estate for $20,000. And his mom had said, don't buy it. You can't wear that anywhere. It's an invitation to murder. Despite the caution, the guest's father bought the necklace. The necklace is a convertible piece, which can be worn as a choker or as two bracelets, showcasing its versatility. The central stone of the necklace is five and a half carats, with an additional 15 carats in the bracelets. With a, about, it's about a carat and three quarters. All together, it's about 23 carats of diamonds. The influx of diamonds from the Cape Colony of South Africa in the early 20th century made jewelry like this. While the necklace is not signed, indicating the maker, the diamonds in the necklace exhibit cape color, meaning they have a slight yellow tint, but they are clean, lively, and cut in the old European style, which makes them sparkle in low-light settings. The appraiser conservatively estimates the necklace's value at about... $60,000 to $90,000, and I would not be surprised by any means if it performed at the high end of that range. Oh my goodness, thank it's you. Just, it is beautiful. Oh, how fun. Yeah. This Fulpur pottery was an inheritance from the guest grandmother. This piece is sentimental for the appraiser who proclaimed that he was a pottery dealer and his first piece of pottery was a Fulpur pottery. However, this pottery is one of the finest early examples of Fulpur pottery, a company that emerged in the late 19th century. The company initially produced stoneware crocks and butter churns, but later pivoted to this distinctive pottery featuring a beautiful Chinese-inspired form with an exquisite glaze craze was kicking in throughout America, John Martin Stangl, who was a member of the family, a German, changed him from a traditional pottery to an art pottery in 09. Moreover, this type of pottery is mass-produced and molded, maintaining the highest quality standards. But one downside of this type of piece is that most collectors of Fulper pottery seek those with early rectangular marks. Due to the recent resurgence in the Fulper pottery market, this piece would sell for a conservative value between $2,500 to $3,500 in today's market. The guest proudly unveils President William McKinley's pocket watch, a cherished heirloom passed down through generations. This exquisite timepiece hails from the renowned Duber Hampton Watch Company. The watch is adorned with a solid 18-karat gold case and meticulously crafted high-jeweled movement. The initials of President McKinley serve as a refutable mark of its historical significance. During his tenure as governor of Ohio, President McKinley received this remarkable watch as a symbol of honor and appreciation. Tragically, President McKinley, the nation's 25th president, met his untimely demise through assassination in 1901. This watch isn't just for telling time. It's a historical gem with a duel that adds extra work. This watch should bring easily $30,000 to $35,000. Wow. I was thinking one or two. It's really nice to know. We really love it. It just, it's, it's our grandmother. I'm very excited. I know my sister will be excited too. This vintage jewelry set, once owned by their grandmother, takes center stage. The guest is particularly captivated by a set crafted by Mario Bucalati, an esteemed Italian jeweler. The set comprises earrings, a bracelet, and a pin, all fashioned from lustrous gold. All the items are crafted by hand from 18-karat yellow gold, including the earrings, bracelet, and pin, which are designed as oak leaves. The gold medal is carefully rolled out and shaped into these forms, with the stems intricately engraved into it. 
Their mastery in engraving and filigree work is evident in the meticulous craftsmanship. Despite being light, the jewelry maintains a resilient springiness due to its precisely chosen metal, ensuring durability over many years of wear. The design resembled oak leaves and had lovely details. The pin stood out with its colorful sapphires. Even though the stones aren't the best quality, the craftsmanship is really impressive. And most importantly, this set could sell for eight to $12,000. It's really nice to know. And we really love it. it just, it's, it's our grandmother. I'm very excited. I know my sister will be excited. This historical chair was made by an Indian chieftain, came to the guest family, and has been passed down through generations. It has been rocked in by five generations, including the guest daughters. The owner's grandfather, in a letter, shared memories of being rocked in it by his grandmother. She would tell me that when my feet would touch the floor, she wouldn't rock me anymore. And secretly, I hoped that my feet never touched the floor. The rocker's attachment with a bolt and nut suggests modern assembly in a factory, not handmade. It's made of hickory, fitting the style of chairs from the old Hickory Chair Company. It's not necessarily from the 18th century. It could date back to the early 19th century. The guest grandfather was born around 1909 aligning with the potential production date of the chair around 1915. The narrative of it being made by an Indian chieftain aligns with the marketing strategy of the old Hickory Chair Company. Despite being common, these chairs are currently in high demand and hold significant potential worth. It's probably at auction, I would estimate it at one to $2,000. Wow! Ever wondered what hidden gems you could find at a garage sale? Well, amidst all the excitement, the guest and her mother stumbled upon a fascinating pickle caster, snagging it for a mere $2.50. The guest polished it expertly, highlighting its intricate design and making it shine even brighter. Pickle casters were used for serving pickles at the turn of the 19th century. Color variations would increase its value. Pickle tongs would hang on the side of the piece. The lid is meant to be placed on top of it. Now, let's uncover the appraiser's value. Four to five hundred dollars. Oh, wow. I'm glad I brought it because my mom didn't even want me to bring it. <laughs> she didn't. Oh, I'm so glad. Updated value of the piece today is between three and four 